one thing we need to say right at the beginning is that we don't profess to be experts on the Post Office by any way, shape, form, or another. Uh, his parents were missionaries on the Navajo reservation 
And as an adult, when World War II got started, he suggested to some of the higher-ups to look into the Navajos as a code. During the 20s and 30s, Japan sent as many people as they could to the United States to be educated. We had the best education system in the world. So as the war was breaking out, Japan could break any code we had. There was not a code they could not break. So basically, here we are getting ready to go war in Japan, and we got no secrets from them. As far as troop movements, ship movements, anything. But there just was hardly any secrets. So they decided to try Navajo. Well, one thing that the Marines, do we have any Marines here? Good. Uh, when the Marines went to the Navajos reservation to get recruits to try this experiment, and they originally started with 30, what they wore was their dress uniforms. Well, I was Air Force, and so I, I, I speak this way. I personally believe that the Marines have the best dress uniform out of any of the five services. They're bright, they're colorful, they're sharp looking. And those uniforms, the colors of the uniforms, the Navajos just were attracted to that, you know. And so they didn't have any problem recruiting them. But when they initially started the program, they were initially going to be recruited as radio operators. Because the powers to be thought they're Indians. They don't have smarts enough to be Marines. We're just going to, and the Marine Commandant said, no. They're going to be with Marines. They're going to be Marines first before radio operators. Well, plus, they were keep, they really thought, well, if the program isn't successful, if this idea right. is not successful, I don't want to have men who aren't combat trained, you know, where we have to protect them or they won't they'll be useless to us. So they've got to be Marines first. Yes, good point. Um, so they had to go through boot camp to prove themselves to be do And during boot camp, several things happen. Now, the Navajos themselves is not a very violent people. They don't like a lot of things. Well, and there was still a lot of racism and prejudice against, quote, Indians at the time. And the drill instructor was one of them. And during part of the training, he said, okay, you guys got to learn to fight. He put all these guys in a circle and said, put two of them out there and said, now fight, box. But well, they didn't know how to box. And they're out there just wrestling and playing, and the group is starting to laugh and giggle, and they're just having a good time. You know, yeah, this is fun now, okay? Well, that got the drill instructor upset. He lined them up and said, you guys need to learn how to fight. You guys need to learn how to take a punch. Kaboom! He hauled off, hits the first one in line. And he's just yelling at him, going right down the line and hitting him. Well, he gets to one guy who happened to be take boxing lessons in high school. And I don't remember his name, but it's in the book. Well, the instructor hauls off and hits him. Well, he ducks. Kaboom! Hits the instructor, knocks him flat on his back, and he stands him. Is that how it's done, sir? <laughs> and the Navajos there, you don't hit the boss. They thought they were just going to go to jail for the rest of their life. I mean, that was the worst thing that they thought he was, it was going to be terrible. But nothing happened to him. In fact, this the drill instructor got in a lot of trouble for hitting the recruits. And he never hit another one. But they, everybody learned something from that. So hence, that's the clock about the boot camp boxing a little bit. <laughs> uh, then, the boot camp speech. My the, boss is up. But the rest oh, of Oh, she's got something else too. Yeah. The, the Navajos excelled in boot camp because they were uh, on the reservation. They didn't have running water. They didn't have electricity. They didn't have vehicles. They would walk for miles. They were sheep herders. So they were used to rough conditions, living on the land, you know, 
sleeping out in the open. So th they and they, uh, a lot of them carried rifles, you know, because of the sheep herding. So they were very good at, uh, at anything to do with boot camp. It was a piece of cake. And when they were in school and on the reservation, they had to wear uniforms, they had to be in line, they were extremely disciplined. So again, this was easy for them. The hardest part of boot camp for them was having a drill instructor looking you right in the eye and you know, look me in the eye, boy, and yelling at you because they are very um, uh, mild-mannered people and they do not yell, they don't raise their voices and it's a sign of disrespect to look someone in the eye. So that was the hardest part. So what I'd like to do is I want to read a speech. Okay. Get up here so I've been here. So this is when they graduated from the world. This is the first truly all-American platoon to pass through this recruit depot. It is, in fact, the first all-American platoon to enter the United States Marine Corps. The rest of us in the Marine Corps are, are American, but our Americanism goes back at, no, at most no more than 300 years. Your ancestors appeared on this continent thousands of years ago, so long ago that there is no written record of them. Through your ancestors, you were Americans long before your fellow Marines were Americans. Yours has been one of the outstanding platoons in the history of this recruit depot, and your letter has gone to Washington telling of your excellence. You obey orders like seasoned and disciplined soldiers. You have maintained rugged health. You have been anxious to learn new duties, and you have learned quickly. As a group, you have made one of the highest scores on the rifle range. The Marine Corps is proud to have you in its ranks, and I am proud to have been the commanding officer of the base while you were here. You are now to be transferred to a combat organization where you will receive further training. When the time comes that you're going to battle with the enemy, I know that I know that you will fight like true Navajos, Americans, and Marines. <laughs> this is why I have her read because I get I get choked up with that all this time I don't know. The fault that we have. But anyway, it's a high honor for that. Any questions so far? Well, we're gonna back up just a tad is that she talked about when these uh, Navajos were in public school as young kids, they were punished, beat mouth washed off the soap. They could not speak Navajo. The, the public schools that they were going to... Well, they were, was, they were government schools and they were to um, go more into white man's culture, I guess, for, yeah. for lack of a politically correct expression. Yeah. So they were trying to eliminate the Navajo out of the Navajo. The bottom line is. So, now, when they leave boot camp, um, they get on a bus and we go to Camp Elliot. And we just found out what Camp Elliot was. Thank you for that wonderful group over there. I thought it was part of Pendleton, but it wasn't. It was just a camp on one side of uh, San Diego. Oh, okay, thank you. Yeah. Uh, and it moved in 1960 and then moved actually to the other side of Pendleton at that time. So anyway, when they graduated boot camp, they were put on a bus to, and to go to a very remote part of Camp Elliot. When they got there, the bus pulls up to the gate, the Navajo see this barracks of theirs with guards on the window. The whole thing is surrounded by a fence with Constantino wire. And they thought they were going to jail. And they were saying, what did we do wrong? Why are we going to jail? They didn't understand because they had no idea what they were going to do now. They had not been informed that they were going to make a cover. So they didn't know. So they got talked and going off the bus, getting into the barracks. Then when they get into the barracks, the door is locked behind them. And they think, what did we do? Well, then an officer was there and then explained to the Navajos, this is what you're going to do. We would like you to try and develop a code using your native language. There's going to be four rules. We start the alphabet, the equivalent, um, after the equivalent, short terms, and memorize everything. The only time pencils and paper were used was in the classroom. No pencils or papers could leave the classroom. They were all locked into a safe.
safe at the time. This is they were now classified top secret. They were. And uh, they took the money. So when that officer left the room, this is the Navajo's first thoughts. Many of these men have been punished, sometimes brutally, for speaking Navajo in classrooms similar to this. Classrooms and schools run by the same government that includes the armed forces. Now this government that has punished them in the past for speaking their language has asked them to use this government for war. The military has to fight people for stranding them in Navajo's in the prison. Because those three 
people that came in, they graduated with us, they did exactly, they went to combat with us, but they're still only known as the original 29. So, so something that they, they came up with, airplanes were named after birds. Uh, like a fighter plane would be a hummingbird. And, uh, and then there was two ways that they used eagle, but I don't remember what kind of plane. I think the transport plane was an eagle, but an eagle when it has uh, something in its talons or feet, there's a different way that you say it. So that went to another type of ship. Uh, and ships were named after fish, like an aircraft carrier might be a whale, and a destroyer might be a shark or something like that. Yeah. So that's how they, you know, because you don't have to come to words for those things, so they use something that they knew. Questions? Okay. So, uh, I think it was 13 weeks, they worked on the code and got approximately a little over 200 words. And the college that being said, okay, you graduated, we will send you into combat. First, combat, Guadalcanal. Anybody with any World War II history knows that Guadalcanal was pretty ugly. Um, they got orders to go to Guadalcanal, and these the Marines, I mean, the Fort were divided up between all the different Marine regiments. Okay, and I'll, some stayed up the and they were all divided. Anyway, when they got to the water canal, they were told to report to the general. Van uh, der report to General Grant Van Okay, well, apparently the general knew of them coming, but he didn't want anything to do with the Indians, you know, because there was still that. What am I going to do with Indians? And he didn't believe what they could do. He, he, and then he got his aide, Lieutenant Hunt, and says, go out and figure out what these guys need to do. We've got this top secret security stuff here. I can send them to see you messages in, in four hours. Okay? So Lieutenant Hunt went out and said, what do you guys do? You don't know. So one of them said, well, we will talk to you when you And, okay. And they said, well, you know, we've got this, this, this crypto code that we can do. And, he, and the um, code talker said, well, how long does that take? He said, about four hours. And they said, well, we can do it in two minutes. Oh, you know, that just, you know, they just more comprehension for that. Well, they, they went out and took a couple of jeeps and they tried it. One of the first things that happened, as soon as they lit up the radio and started talking Navajo, all of a sudden, the uh, other Marines with radios and stuff started jamming the frequencies because they thought that Japanese broke into their code and into their frequencies and were not trying to use their frequencies. Nobody was told. And so the Ten Hunt said, whoa, whoa, stop. And so he said, we'll try this again in the morning. And so what they came up with is that any time a Navajo code talker would want to get on the radio, they would say either Arizona or New Mexico. <laughs> as soon as the other radio people heard that, the code talkers had all priority. Every, and then there was more of the problems after that. They proved themselves over and over in Guadalcanal. And, and it was very quickly that um, the, the generals, the people of power said, these people are valuable. They can send and receive messages extremely accurate within seconds. Can, can you imagine that, you know, okay, he's the general, he issues the order, I'm the radio man, I have to put it into the coding machine, then it gets trans, you know, transmitted, they pick it up at the other end, they have to decode it, how, how long that would take, and lives are at stake. Now, the not post, He's not a he, tell, he hears the, the order in English. In his head, it's already translated to Navajo. He sends it to me in Navajo, and I am translating it in English. I mean, that's how good yeah. these guys were. Yeah. Yeah. And didn't make mistakes, or rarely make mistakes. And, um, yeah. It, and one thing you talked about is that they would, 
monitor each other for mistakes also. And, but the, it was rare that any of them made a mistake. But can you just imagine in your head, you're given an order. Now, as you're reading the order, you're actually reading it in your head, in Navajo, but not necessarily in Navajo. You're reading it in the Navajo code. And then you're transmitting it in this code. The guy who's receiving it is hearing it in code, but writing it down in English. And in a couple of different cases, but, yeah. I just wanted to mention another thing. I might be getting a little bit ahead. But they, one way to break the code is repetition. So they had to come up with three alphabets. So you have three words for the letter A. So, so, so if I'm trying to spell something with three different A's in it, I'm going to use three different A's. Now, one was, uh, and I I don't know how to speak novel, but it was Wallachi, is ant. And that was one, so okay, that's another thing. You know, that starts with a W, and they're going to say, well, watch it to me, and then I have to know, okay, that's an A, you know, that's ant, and then, and it's, just, it's just amazing to me that they did that. At, at the very end, we'll show you the code. So, so anyway, Guadalcanal, they proved themselves. But they, throughout the war, the new code talkers came in, and they were assigned the ships, and did this. They had to continually prove himself to the powers that be. So, now, they were top secret. Not what, this whole thing was top secret with the Nautilus. And they had a couple minor breaks that the people didn't really know about. But the Arizona Highway incident, uh, Arizona Highway was a magazine in Arizona. Well, somebody wrote in there to the magazine and described the code talkers, what they were doing and how they were doing it. And it was written by a gentleman named James Stewart. And I wish it'd be in the BFW I'm in, mean, we have a gentleman named James Stewart. And I keep trying to get him to one of these talks because I want to pick on him. But, but it's not the Jimmy Stewart that we know as an actor. But the powers that be, they just blew a gasket. Because everything was just out there. How they got that, they don't know, but Everything seemed to settle down, and it didn't seem to be any kind of breaches, you know, with the Japanese. So, uh, but this was the last time there. There were multiple battles throughout the Pacific, as you all know, but Iwo Jima was the next biggest one. Um, and again, as you can see, over 800 messages sent by the code talkers in 48 hours. Not one single mistake. Now, can you imagine, you know, we're talking about how you're, 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 you're thinking English and Navajo and code all at the same time, but now you're being shot at, you got bombs dropping in the morning, and one thing that the Japanese were very good on is triangulation. So they'd hear these radio signals, they could triangulate that, and very quickly drop the mortar on that exact same spot. So these Navajos had to do the transmitting real quick, and then move to another foxhole if they could. Um, and so they were always moving. And the code talkers, they were, they were in pairs. Because one talker would have to hand crank the radio. That was his job. And they would switch to, in two hours. Then the other guy who was doing all the talking would do the cranking, and the other guy would talk on the radio. So it was a two-person operation. Several days of fighting, 895 Marines lost, including three code talkers that were shot and killed. Uh, and a couple were wounded. Uh, how would that be? Major Connor stated that without the Navajos, Iwo Jima would have never been taken. One thing that happened at Iwo Jima, and it happened at some other islands too, that the Marines, when they got up to Saravachi, took that, and they're starting to clean out the caves that Japanese were strongholding in. They come across all this food the Japanese had in there. Well, the food was good old American food that we had sent to Japan in the 30s because of some earthquakes and for relief over there. Well, the military took it and was using the American food to fight the American. And that, a lot of Marines and the Kotakas were just devastated to see that the Japanese were feeding on American food that we had given the country for relief during the disaster. So. 
things, things like that happen. Navajo, the Japanese figured out it was a Navajo language. They searched her POW camps. They found a POW named Joe Kiyomi who was Navajo. Well, Joe had survived the hand death punch. He was in a uh, POW camp in the Philippines. The Japanese saw him and they thought that he was uh, a Japanese, but who was American by birth. They sent him to Japan to be converted back to Japanese. And so he was in a Japanese POW camp up there and they were trying, trying to convert him back to be Japanese. You're, you are Japanese at heart. And he said, no, I'm an American Indian. I'm Navajo. I'm not Japanese. Well, when the Japanese figured out that, hey, it's a Navajo language, they brought him into this town and said, we got recordings of this this conversation. Tell it was it what does it say? Oh, okay. So you heard the recording, he became elated. That's my language. I understand what they're saying. It doesn't make any sense, but I understand it. That's my native language. Oh yeah, what are they saying? Well, it doesn't make any sense. It's like saying like the whale and the egg are climbing a tree. I don't know what that means. You know, hence the code within a code. Even the Navajo who knew Navajo didn't understand what was being said. And so he was tortured for two weeks. Horribly tortured. But then end up, Japanese said, okay, he doesn't know. They sent him back to the POW camp. The next day after he left Nagasaki, if he had been there one more day, he would have survived. But he did survive. And he spent years in the hospital after the war getting over it. So, but the code talkers were used, you know, after Japan surrendered. Because all the scientists, people back in, um, who worked at this atomic testing, wanted to know. They sent all these questions. What happened when the bombs went off? Survivors, illnesses, what did the land look like? You know, they had all these questions. Well, the Navajos, uh, they used their code and sent answers back to all the questions. They could only go at night. So they would transmit at night. And all the questions would be answered. So they did that for a long time. Or for however long it took. Oh my gosh, Dad, what is that? So the war's over. So you can fall over. These Navajos have been at war. Honda. Four of the things that they've gone through. Not Navajos in general, but the Army, the Marines. Horrible things. Some of the stuff that they have to go through. She got that one We've read another yeah. book. I also wanted to point out that that once the, the original, the 32 that went over there, when they proved how valuable they were, that they were saving lives by their rapid transmissions, they were never they never went home. They never went on R and R because it's like, well wait a minute, you're experienced now. So they went from campaign to campaign to campaign. And all they would do is, as the new, newly trained code talkers would come in, they'd break up the teams. So, okay, these two guys went through Guadalcanal together, but then they take them and put them with two new guys that were just coming in. But they, the Navajos never went, like the first Marines after Guadalcanal, the first Marine division got to go on our arm. They didn't. They stayed. And they went through all of these campaigns. Everyone. And they were divided amongst different uh, groups. They were with the Raiders. You got a question? Uh, did they go over in the Korea? Oh. Um, yes, they did, but I'll talk about that shortly. <laughs> okay. Her question was, is, did after World War II, did they get to Korea? Yes, they did, but the code was never used. Okay. Um, but anyway, they come back from combat. Anybody who's been in combat knows it, 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 it plays horrible mental games as well. And uh, PTSD, 
uh, combat fatigue. We have all sorts of different names for it. Uh, it can be ugly. The um, Navajos had their traditions firmly in French. They got home, and yes, some had horrible nightmares, headaches, multiple problems. But they had their traditions to fall onto. They would go to these ceremonies, strip off their clothes, put them in a pile, stand on them, and then go into these ceremonies. Well, the sweat. The sweat lodges and, and other different ceremonies that they had. And they'd be in there for one day, two days, three days, four days, I think up to five days that they would go through this type of ceremony. And the ceremonies not necessarily would not be in one place. They'd have to go to different areas for these ceremonies. But when they went through these ceremonies, and we talked about Chester Nez, the first one, when he went through his ceremony, he's having horrible nightmares and all that. Never had a problem after the ceremony. You know, it, it helped them. It helped them. But we, as, for lack of better terms, white people that came back, didn't have any of that. We were told, okay, you got to go see the shrink. Okay, forget about it. Get back to work. Here's a GI Bill. You know? Um, <laughs> It just wasn't that kind of stuff. Well, plus yeah. the code was still classified information, so it was still top secret. So they were told, thank you for your service. Go home. Don't speak of this in case we have to use the code again, because since it hadn't been broken. So it wasn't declassified until 1968, so that's like 24 years. Mm -hmm. See, can you imagine you come home, you can't even talk, you can't talk to your family, or you girlfriend, your wife, anybody, and and you can't go and talk to a psychiatrist or, so thank God they had the traditions where they had some way of you know, cleansing that from there. Yeah, 1968, as she says, it was declassified, 1969, uh, they started getting their uh, first honors, and it was really the first time that uh, they're starting to realize what they did. You know, the enormous gift. Go ahead. <laughs> For the first time since the war ended, the Navajo Code Talkers found a measure of the importance of what they had done during the war. They were stunned by the outpouring of respect and affection from the 4th Division members and had difficulty finding words that expressed what they were feeling. Outwardly, they appeared to be the same stoic, unperturbed Navajos, but inside they were deeply moved. As the war changed them in ways they could not have imagined, so did this first taste of recognition. They began to realize the enormous gift they had given this country in its time of need, and it was one of the proudest moments of their lives. When a lot of them came back, they took advantage of the GI Bill, went to school, and did all this, and when they were questioned about, oh, you were in the war, what did you do? Uh, well, we were just in the Marines and we fought in war. That's basically all they said. And that was good enough for, you know, the other people that they were telling. August 14th, National Code Talker Day, 1982, declared by Ronald Reagan. Um, it says there, when uh, Japanese were defeated by Indians. Well, that was the headline that day over in Japan. Well, language they were forbidden to speak. Same language that saved us. <laughs> this particular picture here, um, first time we gave this was at Pearson Field Education Center in Vancouver. And a group of uh, Navajos came in also, and they were carrying the same book that we have, which was kind of funny. But anyway, as I was going through the talk, and he made a couple points about this, and but this picture came up and he said, oh, can I talk about that picture? Well, he came up and identified several of the code talkers, and he said, this gentleman here, he says, I worked with him for years. He had a master's degree in forestry. And he never talked, you know, about the code. He said, I didn't even know he was a code talker until just a few years ago. Uh, and he named off a couple of the other ones. I, I really don't remember what said. But they went on to get lots and lots of education. They became 
uh, teachers, principals, uh, engineers, artists, uh, everything that this private group represents also. They became everything. They went off in their own directions and became highly educated and did amazing things with their life. For them going to war, them going to be in the code doctors, it changed them. They had a lot of respect for what they did. They had a lot of respect for themselves, and they became, went on and become uh, educated. And uh, several of them became, um, as a hobby, they became golden glove boxers. <laughs> and, and had fun with that. We have a, a friend in Vancouver who wasn't able to make it. His dad was a code talker. And he talks about um, that when he was growing up, his dad was the golden glove boxer. He said, he practiced on us all the time. <laughs> <laughs> Tried to teach us. And this is his dad. This is Dave, Dave Patterson, received a silver medal from Obama. Now, how many code talkers were there? We can only say that there's approximately 450. Why approximately? It should be an exact number. Well, Dave Patterson is listed in our book, and they list all the code talkers there. When he was in the war, he was known as Dave Blue Horse. After he got out, went to college, he changed his name to Dave Patterson. He's listed in the book twice. <laughs> Did you have a question, sir? Okay. Um, so there is not an active count. And uh, let's say when the, the original 32 graduated, there was a little over 200 words. At the end of the war, there was somewhere between five and 600 words. So when, like Kareem mentioned, these new code talkers would come in, they would have to teach the old code talkers the new words. And so it was a constant learning practice uh, for them. War to end. Like Kareem mentioned, from the day they left to boot camp, they never had a day off. Because they were just indispensable. They, the, the generals and everything knew just how valuable these code talkers were. Okay, now. <laughs> this, is, this is the code. We have any questions so far? Okay. Um, one thing we'll mention here. In this book, um, we don't sell the book. It's available on Amazon. But in the back of the book, it lists all the words, including the alphabet, um, that the code talkers came up with. Okay? And so, just as a way of fun, we come up with a little code here. Now, in order to solve this code, the answer's on the back side. But what you have to do is that you look at the first word, G-L-O-E-I-H. So then you go through, and you have to go through all this to find what that letter is. Each word just represents, <coughs> represents a letter. Okay? Uh, we have... He's shaking his head no. Yeah. <laughs> this is, uh, it looks difficult, but once you get started on it, you'd be surprised how easy it goes. So this is the simple one. If you want one that's a challenging one, this is the challenging one because there is no commas between each letter. <laughs> it just all runs together. Now this particular code here is that when they made this book, and Navajos wrote this book, is that they put this code in there and for you to figure out. And it's called A Message from the Navajos. Very good. So uh, who would like a code? Oh, oh, oh. oh. I'm sorry, before we get started here, uh, where did I put my glasses so I can see what I'm doing? Uh, oh, right here. Okay. Now, now you'll have to excuse me here just a minute, because I am kind of clumsy with this computer here. But one thing that um, when I did this talk in Virginia, it was brought up to me that why don't you have uh, sound bite. Sound bite. And okay, how do I forget? Okay, so 
the sound bite that I had, it disappeared. I can't even find it on the website anymore. So, but I have this one here. And our two Marines are going to enjoy this. Now, bear with me while I get this thing fired up. Okay, that's on. That's on. Okay, that's all. Okay. This way to in the in the they used their straight native language. They didn't try to put their language within a code. They so, yeah, so. No, this is different. That's the hard one. This is the, I'm, I'm handing out the easy one. So, again, if anybody figures this out, and we'll have a prize for you at our table. Just please come up. And any questions at all? Yes. Oh. Uh, I saw it set up there. It was the only military code that was deciphered. So the Japanese found out that the code was Navajo, but they never were able to translate never broke anything. It. Never broke. It. it was the only military code in military history that was never broken. Wow. So, hmm. uh, did you get one? Anybody not get one? I would probably hear because I'm being technical. They said even if you spoke non-Hoo, you wouldn't know what they were saying because they, you know, they're using regular terms. You know, onion, apple, turkey, but they're still. Yeah, exactly. We're right by the hangar doors in this hangar, all the way. Yeah. Any other questions? The book. Who's the author? Uh, Jane McCain. Sally McCain. Sally McLean. Sally McLean. And it's on. It's on. It is on Amazon. And I say we don't try to sell anything. Howls this might have it too. Howls. Yeah, they, they, they make that's local. Yes. They yeah. have and a lot of. They, uh, the, the, uh, and I was telling you, there's <laughs> one. Uh, Chester Ness. Chester Ness. Yeah, yes. they wrote a book, and his is called Code Talker, and that's more of a first-person account. Yeah. So and they're both very good. When Chester Ness wrote his book, first person comp, like she says, and it gets really ugly at times. He talks about when they were in different islands over there, and they got to go from foxhole to foxhole, and it's raining, and they're up to their chin in water, 
they can't leave. They're trying to keep the radios dry, you know, and it's horrible. And guess what? No matter how bad it gets, you still got bathroom duties one and two that need to be completed. Well, guess where that was done? In the foxhole. And at times, their helmets had to be used as the commode. That's awful. Yeah, and then they have to turn around and cook in it. At times, they talk about make, talks about making fry bread in their helmets and stuff. Well, and and it's another a, thing he talked about too was uh, you stayed in that foxhole until you received the order to move because the Japanese had the Bushido Code, which was, you know, I'm going to die with honor. So they would attack at night, yelling bonsai, you know, uh, like, which translates to like, long live the emperor or something like that. And they, so they would attack and take out as many as they could. So you didn't get out of the foxhole because you could be killed by friendly fire. And, and so having to stay in there for hours and, we, he said, like, we, our knee caps would be under our chin and we have to up to our knee caps. Trying to stay dry, stay alert. And, and then there was the, uh, They talked rams, about the, uh, they were in these foxholes fighting. He talks about the death all around them. The bodies that are rotting and decaying, both Japanese and American, and nobody can get out there and do anything about them. And he said some of the worst times that he remembers there is the fact that at night these bodies went out, they're rotting and decaying. Well, they had these big old crabs, sand crabs, that come out of the crabs and come out of the sand and feed on the deck. And they could hear them crunching bones and stuff. Saltwater crocodiles would get out and feed on the deck. And every once in a while the saltwater crocodiles would find their way into a foxhole and you'd hear people shooting them. And this is just a sample of some of the horrors they went through. Yes, ma'am? Uh, did these people get over to Germany? No, they were never in Europe. Yes. Okay, so the average soldier over there running around in Eagle Dima might have been 19 or 20. Yes. Or 18 or 19. Or How even 16. How old were the Kotak? Were they older than that? Uh, the Kotak was roughly the same age. Uh, some managed to enlist when they were 15 years old, 16 years old, because there was no birth record, they just show up and say, hey, I'm 18. And they had to take the word for it. But like Chester Nez, we talked about him, he was 16 when he when he got in the Marines. I think the oldest one was 32. 35. 35. 35 when he got in. And he lied about his age the other way. Yeah. <laughs> so. so you mentioned that they did make it to Korea, but the code was... Oh, when she mentioned Korea, after World War II, the, a lot of the co truckers got out of the military. But as any military member knows, there were several that stayed in for life. They became lifers. And they served, in some so co truckers served in World War II, Korea, and Vietnam. But they did not work with the code. They were different things. Uh, Ches Kinez talks about that he was uh, recruited when, during Korea but he ended up going to Idaho doing security police work. <laughs> so the code was never, ever used again. So, any other questions? If you have more questions, again, we'll be at the table. You're welcome to come and talk. This is a topic that we just enjoy talking about. We're not experts. We just enjoy flapping our jaws and, and talking about these heroes that are being forgotten. We did. Oh, yes. I just want to thank you both for doing this. I think about the tribes on the river and burning the classroom and these stories on the pole. No. And so I really appreciate oh, you sharing this information. Thank you. Yeah, brilliant. <laughs>